right? Martin Luther King had a vision. He stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and told us his vision, but his vision became our vision. So I may not have come up with that vision, but I found it, and I'd like to devote time and energy to help advance it, even beyond him. We have to give our people a just cause. We have to have trusting teams. We have to create environments inside our organizations in which people feel psychologically safe, safe enough to raise their hands and say, I made a mistake or I need help. Uh, the absence of trusting teams means we have groups of people lying, hiding, and faking. And that comes from good old-fashioned leadership. Leadership is not about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in our charge. And the very responsibility of a leader is not to drive performance. Leaders are not responsible for the results. Leaders are responsible for the people who are responsible for the results. And the problem is, is we don't teach people how to lead. Right? When you're very, very junior, we give people tons of training how to do their jobs. Some people get advanced degrees how to do their jobs so that they'll be good at them. And if you're really good at your job, we'll promote you. And eventually you get promoted to a position where you're now responsible for the people who do the job you used to do, and we don't teach you how to do that. So how can we expect people to be good at their jobs if we don't train them how to do it? Like, would you go see a doctor that didn't go to medical school? No. So why would we work for a leader who has no training in being a leader? That's why we get managers. That why, that's why we get micromanagers. That's why we get toxicity. It's not because they're bad people. It's because they don't know what they're doing. And they're making it up as they go along. And those lucky times that we get to work for a great leader, well, they were lucky that they probably had a great leader before them. Or they learned it somewhere else. Or maybe they had a terrible leader and they committed to do the total opposite of everything. The point is, they learned it. Well, we have to teach leadership so that leaders can create environments in which all of us can work to our natural best. That produces trusting team. What does it mean to be a great parent? Like, I don't have five things to be a great parent, right? It's a lifestyle, and it's, it comes number one with the commitment that I am responsible for the life of another human being, the growth of another human being. The closest thing to leadership is parenting. You have to be an infinite student of parenting. You know, you want to be a parent, you ask your friends, you ask your own parents, you join groups, you read magazines, you watch talks, whatever it is, you're constantly consuming how to deal with this constantly changing challenge of being a parent. And it's ups and downs and successes and failures, you know, and that's what it is. Leadership is the same. Leaders, great leaders are students of leadership. No matter how achieved they may be, um, they're still learning. Um, and it's a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle of what I need to do to look after people, which includes things like listening, uh, learning how to give and receive feedback, um, learning how to have effective confrontations, how to discipline when necessary in a way that's constructive. Um, roam the halls, get to know people, learning what it means to, to ask somebody questions. How do you ask questions? You know, like some people are naturally good at being curious about other human beings and some people are uncomfortable because they're introverts or whatever socially awkward, but we can learn, you know? How do you learn to remember people's names? Oh, I'm bad at names. No, you've just decided you're bad at names. We can learn to be good at names so that when we walk down the hall and say, hey Tom, oh my God, he remembers my name. It's a nice feeling. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. There are many, many things we have to do and constantly work on to be a great leader to create that environment. So there's another guy who does what I do. Uh, he's extremely well respected. Um, he does extremely good work. Um, I hate him. I have no, I have no, uh, you know, it's, he's always been very nice to me when I've seen him professionally. It just, I have an irrational hatred of him. And, uh, whenever his name comes up, I like, it drives me nuts. Like people bring it, like we're, we hired him. I was like, oh. you know? uh, and, and I, and because I'm, because I, I hate him, uh, I'm really competitive with him. And so I will go online and look at my book rankings and I'll immediately check his. <laughs> and mind you, I don't look at anybody else's, just his. And uh, if I'm ahead, I've got this like smug feeling. And if he's ahead, uh, I get really pissed off, you know? Um, so anyway, we had the opportunity to uh, speak at the same event. I don't mean like me in the morning, him in the afternoon, afternoon. Like we were interviewed together on the stage. And the interviewer thought it would be fun if <clears throat> if we introduced each other. And so I went first. And then I looked at him and I said, um, you make me really insecure. Um, all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And uh, when your name comes up, it makes me really uncomfortable. And he looked at me and he said, 
funny. I feel the same about you. The reason I had such an irrational hatred of him had nothing to do with him. It had to do with me. He's my worthy rival. His strengths revealed to me my own weaknesses. And instead of confronting and taking a hard look at myself and evaluating those weaknesses and working on those weaknesses, it was much easier to take all of that negative energy and direct it towards him. In other words, to be competitive, to want to beat him, right? It was a very cathartic experience. Uh, um, we've since become very close friends, have worked together. I no longer check his book rankings. And because we share the same cause, we can actually work together. Um, and, so, and so what I recognized was so often in business we have these competitors, sometimes on our own teams, that we want to beat them. We've all had the experience where one of our colleagues got a promotion and we got upset, we got angry. We got angry at somebody else's success. Think about that for a second. Why couldn't we share in the joy, right? What is it about them that's being revealed in us? That's the problem, right? And so having worthy rivals instead of competitors, competitors are, are other players we set out to beat. But the problem with that is there's no finish line. And so if we're obsessed with beating the other company, then at some point, sure, you're ahead in whatever metric you chose until when, right? At what expense, at what cost? Uh, that's not sustainable. But rather, the other players inside our industry, outside our industry, on our own teams, we can choose our own worthy rivals. Their strengths reveal to us our weaknesses, and by having our weaknesses reveal to us, it means we have the opportunity to grow and improve. And the infinite game, at its core, is basically a game of constant improvement. And so our, our, our worthy rivals reveal to us our weaknesses and our opportunities to improve.